Stephen, welcome to our Facebook live video feed this morning, uh, March the 15th, uh, 2020. Uh, you, you may need to go to your video section in your Facebook page to find us. Uh, I hope that uh, it's coming through and that, uh, that you're able to see and worship with us this morning. Uh, of course, you know that we're going through some very unprecedented times in our nation with this coronavirus and everything. Society seems to have come to a standstill, uh, but we are nonetheless going to persevere and are thankful that our God is an amazing God and He does great things and we serve a living and risen Savior. Uh, by way of announcements for our church family, uh, we will not be having service this Wednesday evening in order to kind of go along with what the recommendations are about social gatherings of large groups of people to help prevent the spread of this virus. Uh, so we will not have Wednesday evening service this coming Wednesday night. Uh, please put that on your calendar. I will uh, if I'm able to do a live feed again on Wednesday evening, which we will be going through uh, the book of Matthew on Wednesday evening on our Facebook Live, I hope that you're able to join us there and participate in that. Uh, again, we're not having Wednesday evening service. Uh, I will try my best to do a remote service this Wednesday. Uh, of course, that kind of depends on what's going on with, with my health and my recovery from the flu. Uh, Genevieve and I have, have been struggling with the flu all week long we had um, three days this week where uh, we had a fever in excess of 102 degrees so uh, we are on the mend and I'm very thankful for this media that we have to be able to communicate with you as a church body uh, to declare the greatness of our God I, I, I can't I can't stress that enough in, in these times we serve a risen and living God. He's, he, none of this has caught him off guard. Not any of it has caught him asleep. Our, our God doesn't sleep. He doesn't slumber. Uh, he doesn't get tired. He knows full well what's going on in our lives. And I know that there are many of you that are sick and afflicted. And I want to tell you, put your trust in Jesus. Uh, he will deliver. He will save. He will heal. And I believe that as uh, the Southern Baptist Convention has asked us to do today uh, for their 47,500 plus churches to come together in a moment of prayer. Uh, they requested this on Friday morning uh, for, for us to pray for God's mercy uh, in this pandemic, that lives would be saved, that this disease would stop in its progression, and, uh, and that, that God would equip those in the medical field to deal with this. They also ask us to pray for our president, Donald Trump, and our governmental leaders. And uh, they also taught us, uh, ask us to pray over the numbering of our days. Uh, as you all know, all of our days are numbered, and we need to take advantage of every single moment, every single second uh, that we have uh, to make an eternal difference in someone's life. Uh, and also yesterday, President Trump made a proclamation of today being a national day of prayer. And he used three scriptures in his proclamation, 1 Peter 5 and 7, casting your care upon him for he careth for you and part of his proclamation. And I want you to know today, Jesus does care for you. He cares a lot for you. He cares so much for you that he died for you on the cross. He also used Psalm 91, a section of it where it says that he is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in him will I trust. It is only in the sovereignty of God that we can trust and that we can have hope and that we can have assurance that we will get through this. Uh, the Bible also says that, that the, the, the people of God have never been forsaken and the seed has not been out begging for bread. And, and I firmly believe that today, that, that God has not forgotten us, forgotten us and he has not uh, caused us to be in this great calamity uh, for no reason. And I don't think he's caused it at all. Uh, things happen in life because of sin. Unfortunately, we still live in a world that is uh, sinful. And sometimes these things happen, these diseases and stuff happen because of what has happened in the past. But nonetheless, I want you to know our God reigns, our God is supreme, and our God is holy and righteous and true. And he also used in uh, his proclamation, Luke 137, that promises us that uh, for with God nothing shall be impossible. And we know this to be true. Uh, as believers in the word of God, we know this to be true, that nothing is impossible with God. And that, that in just a few moments, we're going to be praying together 
as a body and as a nation in the whole uh, country uh, of believers praying and asking God to move in a sovereign and mighty way. We've been praying for years for revival to come to our land. Uh, we've been praying for years for God to move. And this could just be the moment that God is going to use uh, the, the Christians, the believers, those who follow Jesus Christ as a catalyst uh, to demonstrate his compassion, his love, his mercy, and his grace by, by reaching out and doing what the scripture says in loving one another as we love ourselves and to love our neighbor as ourselves and to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And on those two foundational passages, those two foundational scriptures uh, are, are the whole law and those two those two phrases, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And your neighbor today might need your help. They might be sick and you don't know it. You might just need to go knock on their door and ask them through the door, is there anything that you can do for them? And reach out and touch your neighbor that you might not otherwise be uh, inclined to go reach outside of a moment like this. So I'm asking you today as believers to spread the love of Jesus uh, in a way that has never been demonstrated before. You don't have to run up to them and hug them. You don't have, you can just express your love for them, leave something on their front door, call and check on your neighbor uh, just to see how they're doing. They may be hurting, they may be sick and you don't even know it and you could be the difference in their life. Um, I'm excited about what we're doing here today. This really is our very first, I would call it a remote um, a service where we're not meeting on the main campus there at 606 Castle Road. Uh, I'm actually doing this from my living room and I hope that you can hear me okay and that the sound and the video quality is good enough for you uh, to, uh, to get something from this message today. But nonetheless, this may be the way we do it for a couple of weeks just to get through this uh, this this situation with this virus because I, I don't know about you but I don't really like being sick I don't like being out of work I don't like being confined to my home or my bedroom in any stretch of the imagination uh, but nonetheless it is a temporary thing I like what the scripture says when it says it came to pass uh, Jesus uses that phrase several times in the New Testament it came to pass and I like it because I like to use it like this it came to pass not to stay Keep that in mind. This came to pass not to stay, and it's not going to stay long. I, I'm, I'm going to declare and decree when we pray today that this virus has to stop moving, it has to stop spreading, and that the name of the Lord Jesus will be proclaimed and that healing will occur in the lives of those that are sick and afflicted with this. Uh, there are several that you know uh, are sick and afflicted. Please remember um, April Abernathy and her husband Kyle Abernathy. I remember Michael, Pastor Michael Abernathy, that he's sick and afflicted. Uh, a good friend of mine, Derek Dyser, is, uh, excuse me, Derek Bryson, excuse me, is, is sick with double pneumonia. All of these four people, they need your touch. Uh, they need the Holy Spirit's touch. They need your prayers today uh, that God would move in their life in an awesome way. I mean, I'm excited about what God is going to do uh, in and through the body of Christ. Uh, we were called for such a time as this. Uh, not to give up, not to give in, not to shrink back, but to push forward, to press forward, uh, to seek those things which are above, not things on the earth. Understanding our help comes from the Lord. Uh, we're going to be praying here in just a moment. It's 11.59, and uh, as soon as, uh, as, as, excuse me, 10.59, as soon as 11 o'clock hits on my iPad here, I'm going to begin praying, and I want you to pray along with me that God would sovereignly move in our country. We need him now uh, more than ever in our whole life, in my lifetime of 54 years, I can assure you I've never seen times like this. I've never seen basically the whole world stop and come to a standstill. And, and I don't think it's just for any uh, arbitrary reason. I, I think God's up to something and, and we need to tune into heaven and we need to hear his voice and we need to implement the plan of God in our society today. I may need to take a drink of that every once in a while because my throat may get a little dry, but nonetheless, uh, we're going to pray. Let's go to the Lord and seek his face right now. Father, in the mighty and the holy name of Jesus, we come 
and we decree and declare that you alone are God, that you alone are sovereign, that you alone are the El Shaddai. You are Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that heals. You are Jehovah Sid Canu, the Lord our righteousness. You are Jehovah Shalom, the Lord our peace. And Father, this morning I pray your peace over this nation. I pray your peace over uh, the world right now, God. Even as this virus has spread to where it is, God, I'm asking you in Jesus' name, in agreement with my brothers and sisters in Christ, that this virus, this attack, has to stop in Jesus' name. That it will go back from where it came and never rear its ugly head again. Father, I speak healing over this, over Bartow County. I speak healing over over Georgia. I speak healing over the United States of America. I speak healing over those that are sick and afflicted. God, we know people by name. Uh, Kyle Abernathy, April Abernathy, Michael Abernathy, Derek Bryson, and others, Lord, who are sick with this disease and other diseases with pneumonia and the flu. God, there are many in our church right now that have flu A, and I speak clearly to those diseases, those viruses, and command them in Jesus' name to loose their bodies and to let them go and to return no more. And that, Father, this, this virus that's afflicting our nation, God, we speak to it and we command it in your name, in the name of the Lord, that it has to let go in Jesus' name. And Holy Spirit of God, I'm asking you in a mighty way to move in our great land once again that, Father, waves of grace and mercy would go from the east coast to the west coast, from the north border to the south border, God. And that, Father, all around the world, that waves of grace and mercy would flood this time, this season, Lord. And that people would turn their hearts to you, God. And that, Father, we would seek your face above all things. And that, God, we would put you as preeminent in our lives. And that the sovereignty of God would prevail, that your word would prevail, that your power would prevail. God, we declare it and decree it in Jesus' name. Father, I love you and I praise you and I thank you for all that you're doing. I thank you, God, for what you're doing at Friendship Baptist. I thank you, God, that you're moving in, in ways that we even can't see, God. And when we can't see you, Lord, we just trust your heart, God. When we can't see your hand, we trust your heart, God. We believe with 100% assurity, Lord, that you are moving right now, Lord. That, Lord, the, the fervent prayers of righteous men and women avail much, God. And we pray this morning in not our own righteousness, Lord, but in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We humble ourselves before you today, Lord. And we declare, Lord, your word, your truth, your power over this great land. Father, we ask you in Jesus' name to move in the lives of those who are lost and undone, that, Father, they would recognize their position without you, that, Father, they would see you as the Lord and Savior of their life, and that, God, that you would prevail, and that, Father, you would send people into their lives to minister Jesus to them, to minister to them in an amazing way, that, Father, their lives will be turned around, Lord. You, you created us for such a time as this, Lord. God, let us not miss our moment. Let us not shrink back. Let us not get scared, Lord. You've not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. God, I pray today that your powerful spirit moves in mighty, mighty ways in our great land. And that, Father, you move in an awesome way, Lord, throughout our country, through every church this morning, through every home, God. Infiltrate every home, Lord, this morning, God. As we, as a people across this land, join together and cry out to you, Lord, to move, to move, to heal, to deliver, and to save, God. In Jesus' name, do it today, Lord. That the name of of our great God would be praised. That the name of our great God would be lifted up. That the name of our great God would be adored. And that, Father, men and women, their hearts would be turned to you. Children's hearts would be turned to you. And that, Lord, we would listen to your voice. We would hearken to your voice, Lord. And that, Father, your peace, 
Oh God, I pray that Jehovah Shalom, the Lord God of peace, just floods every household this morning. That Father, that neighborhood suddenly sense a, a presence of peace. That homes and families where, where arguments and frustrations and, and worry and fear were, were once there, Lord, you replace that with your presence and your peace. And I'm asking you, God, to do it in Jesus' name. That, Lord, we don't stand on our own word. We stand on your word. That where two or three are gathered in your name, Lord, you're there in our midst. And, God, we're gathered together across the Internet across airwaves, across radio waves in this great country right now, God, and asking you as a people of God to move in our great land, to move in a mighty way, God, to change the hearts of this people, Lord, to change the hearts of our leaders, God, to speak to them today, Lord, to speak to our president, to wrap a hedge of protection round about him and round about every Congress member, around every senator, around every House of Representative, Lord. Wrap your hedge of protection round about them, Lord. Speak to them, God. Convict them, Lord Jesus, that unity would prevail. And that, Father God, that you would rebuke the enemy over our great land. And that, Father, we would be a beacon of light and hope to the world that says this is the way, walk in it. That, God, that we would follow Jesus as a country, as a people, and hunger and thirst for your righteousness, God, and not our own. Now, Lord, we love you and we praise you and thank you. Lord, your word says that, that Lord, we should be anxious for nothing, but in everything with, with prayer and thanksgiving and supplication, we make our requests known to you with faith mixed in, God, and we do that today, God. Lord, we look forward with great anticipation as to what you're going to do through this, this troubling time, Lord. We look forward over the next few days and weeks to hearing great miraculous stories of healing and deliverance and salvation and restoration in Jesus' name, God. We thank you for it, Lord. We declare it and we decree it in the mighty and the holy name of Jesus. And we, we look forward with great anticipation, God, and excitement in our hearts, God, that you're up to something and you're up to something good. Now, Lord, we place it all in your hands right now, Lord. We place it all in your hands and we declare it in the mighty and the holy and the matchless and the wonderful name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Lord, and our King. Amen and amen. Well, if you're just joining us this morning, we started just a little bit early because I found out this morning that the National Day of Prayer actually was supposed to start at 11 a.m., and I did not know that. And if you got the notice on our Facebook page, you were kind of made aware of it that we would be starting at 10 till 11. Uh, but I hope that you're tuned in now, and I want to talk to you this morning out of the Scripture for a little bit, and I want to talk to you out of Psalm 121. <clears throat> Excuse me if I clear my throat every once in a while. I'm recovering from the flu this week. Uh, but Psalm 121 is absolutely one of my absolute favorite psalms uh, because it, it is titled in my scripture as a psalm of ascent. And a psalm of ascent means a psalm of uplifting. And, and of course, in these times right now, we don't need to be focused on necessarily things of a downward nature. We need to be focused on things of an upward nature, uh, something that rises above the situation I've heard it said many, many years ago that we, we set our expectation in God higher than our circumstances. And I genuinely believe that, that, that in this moment, the circumstances dictate chaos and, and, and trouble and anxiety, but we don't set our expectation there. We set our expectation in God because our expectation in God is higher than any circumstance that we face as a people of God today. And we also serve as a beacon of light and hope. So what I want to title my sermon today is a time of ascent in moments of distress. Because I think we need to understand that we have to have, and we have to have within us, a message of hope 
in a dark time. And, and folks, we really are, and I'm not being negative about it, I'm being realistic about it. We are in a dark moment in our country. And really, we're in a dark moment in the world. But, but nonetheless, in our immediate country, we're in a dark moment. And, and we, as the people of God, need to look up, not down, up to a holy God, up to a righteous God, up to a sovereign God who is up to something good. And I firmly believe that God has a plan. His plan is working, and His plan includes you. His plan includes you. You are a part of God's plan, and I want you to know that. If you've already turned there, Psalm 121 in the Scripture says this. And if you have a Bible like mine, and I say this on Sunday mornings, uh, it's going to be found on page 543, and I'll be reading from the New King James Version, and I will be reading through the whole Scripture, all eight verses. And this is what the scripture says in Psalm 121. I will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve your going and your coming in from to and from this time and forevermore. I, I love that scripture. It is very powerful because at the very beginning of it, it says, I will lift up my eyes. And I think that's the key to this understanding, this whole passage here, is we have to make a conscious decision to lift up our eyes. Sure, all the circumstances around us may dictate, I've got to go rush out and buy all the groceries I can. I've got to rush out and buy all the toilet paper. I've got to rush out and buy all of this stuff. And, and that keeps us focused on the immediacy of the situation, the chaos. But even in all of that, we have to, as a people of God, make a conscious decision to remember who we are and to who we belong to and lift up our eyes to the hill. Not just any hill, not just a hill in your backyard, not just any mountain in the Rocky Mountains, but the hill called Calvary. Because it's on the hill of Calvary that our purchase, our price was paid for our salvation. And it's from that, that sacrifice our strength comes. It's from the blood that was spilled on the cross that you and I have access to the very throne room of God. And we have the ability to lift up our eyes <clears throat> off of our current situation and place them on the Lord Jesus because that's where our help comes from. We have to stop looking downward in these times of distress and we start looking to him for our strength. But it's not just in times of distress that we need to look unto our God. We also need to look unto him in times of favor. And sometimes I believe that that's the most difficult time to serve God is in times of favor. Because we have a tendency to get comfortable. We sit back in our chair of life and we kind of place life on cruise control. Uh, we don't ever need to place our life on cruise control. And we don't ever need to, to have these, these ups and downs that are so sharp that we only cry out to God when we're at our lowest point. We need to continually cry out to God whether we're low in the middle or on the mountaintop because our God is wherever we are. Where can I go from your spirit, says the, the psalmist, whether I make my bed in heaven or I make my bed in hell. Behold, you're there in both of those places. And I submit to you this morning that he's there in every place in between. Jesus said in the book of Revelation that he is the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. And that speaks to me as not just events, 
but a person. The person of the Lord Jesus Christ is the beginning and He is the end. He is the first and He is the last. And those events are not just something that happened to us. It's a person that happens in us. And I want you to know that person, Jesus Christ, is available to you right now, this very moment. And that he is moving very quickly on your behalf. And he wants you to look to him for your strength, for your patience, for your peace, for your prosperity, for your purpose and destiny. Because when you find that, when you find him, you find all of those things. We as our believers, we have to keep our focus and our gaze upon the Lord. The scripture there says that, that uh, excuse me, let me turn back one page. Uh, the scripture says that I will lift up my eyes to the hills from which cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Notice that there says that who made heaven and earth. Our God is the creator of the heavens and the earth. He made everything that we can see and everything that we can't see. And we must look unto him for all of our uh, strength, for all of our purpose, for all of our destiny. And not look up and down to natural things because those things will fail us. If you didn't know this earlier in the week, the stock market failed a lot of people. Natural things will fail every single time. God never fails. There have been lots of worry and stress this week, but I'm here to tell you our God prevails. We have a God that sits on the throne that created everything. He created you with purpose and with being and with destiny in mind. He's not forgotten about you. Even though you may think he has, he's not forgotten about you. He created you for a reason, and the reason is to bring glory and honor to him, to go out and share your testimony of what he's done in your life with anyone who will listen. We can't walk around looking up at the sky in a natural way. That's not what that scripture means. The scripture's not saying, well, I'm just going to lift up my eyes and, and, and look around and, and, and see. And, and see. Well, I see my roof, my ceiling. I see the sky and the clouds. Well, I'm not finding any. You won't find it in the natural. You've got to look beyond that and look into the spiritual. We've got to see into the heavens, as Jesus said in the model prayer, as in heaven, so on earth. You know, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on the earth as it is in heaven. And in order for the kingdom of God to be implemented on the earth in these earthen vessels, as the scripture calls us, we have to have a, a, a tangible, real relationship with him. We have to hear his voice. We have to obey him, and we have to do what's being done in heaven here on the earth. And it really can be as simple as loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving your neighbor as yourself. There's no better time than right now than to love your neighbor as yourself. To maybe reach out across the street and say, hey, is there anything I can do for you? Because that's a demonstration of the love of God. You see, there's comfort, there's peace, there's protection, there's healing, salvation, and assurance in knowing that Jesus supplies all our needs. That Jesus supplies all our needs. Uh, this may be different for you. I'm giving you uh, the assurance it is different for me because I'm in my mind's eye, I'm having to visualize some of you sitting in my congregation as if I were standing behind the pulpit so that I can visualize someone I'm speaking to this morning. And I hope that you're tuned in and I hope that you're listening because God's speaking in this hour. You may be wondering, where is God? He's right where he's always been. God has not changed. He's not left you. He's not forsaken you. All you have to do is tune your ear to his voice. And there's healing, there's peace, comfort, and joy found in the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I posted this on our, our Facebook page last night and on my, my personal storyline. A.W. Tozer said this, a scared world needs a fearless church. And that speaks volumes to me. A.W. Tozer is probably one of my, my most favorite uh, writers of, of, of days before. 
because what he's written in, in the 40s and 50s and, and such are so profoundly relevant for us today. Uh, it, they speak volumes. And, and for this moment, this phrase right here, a scared world needs a fearless church. When Peter recognized Jesus as the son of the living God, Jesus said that on that revelation, the revelation not of Peter, but of the revelation that was given to Peter of Jesus Christ being the son of God, he's going to build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail. I, I tell you today, a scared world needs a fearless church. And a fearless church is a church that stands firm on the foundation of the scripture. A fearless church is a church that's empowered by the Holy Spirit. A fearless church is a church that lifts up their eyes and all of their being to the hills, to the hill of Calvary, to the open grave of the, the resurrection. Uh, Jesus Christ is alive and well today. And the world needs to see a fearless church, not a reckless church, a fearless church. One that's abandoned to the cause of Christ. One that, that unashamedly proclaims that he is Lord and he is King. The world around us, folks, is, is, is failing and it's scared in so many ways. Guess what? You and I have the message. Uh, you and I have uh, the answer to their, their, their woes. You and I have the answer to what is scaring them. I, remember, I told you, our God is not a God of fear. He's not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. Those three things, power, love, and a sound mind. We have power in the spirit. We have the love of Jesus because we've experienced it in our own lives. And we have the clarity of thinking in these moments of crisis because of the Holy Spirit. Don't forget that. That you have clarity of thinking in this moment. Grasp that, believers. Listen to that. You have power, love, and sound thinking, clear thinking. In the moments of chaos, God has given us that spirit, that spirit where we can look up unto him and know our help comes from him. Notice that scripture says he doesn't sleep, he doesn't slumber. He, he provides protection. He provides a way out. And it's through him, it's through him. It's through him. Surrender your life to him today. Pray like never before today. Avail yourself today to God like never before. You might have a gift and a calling and a talent that, that could, might not have been used had this moment never occurred. God might have gifted you with the, the gift of encouragement. And if you have not been at home this week, you might not have been able to encourage someone. God might have gifted you with some extra funds and someone else is hurting. God might have gifted you with that this week so that you could help someone else that's hurting. I've read countless stories of people providing for others that did not have in their moment of lack. Christians, we should be on the forefront of that. I know the pay it forward movement, it really works, but we need to do it not just to pay it forward. We need to do it with no expectation of anything in return. We need to do it simply because Jesus first loved us. If you find yourself in a line somewhere and someone finds herself short of money, you make up the difference for them. You might be the person that makes a difference in their life right now. And if this moment had not occurred, you wouldn't be where you are. Everything that we do, folks, everything that you and I do has purpose. Everything that you and I do has meaning. There are no accidents in life, no coincidences in life when it comes to our service to the Lord. Everything, the, the steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. That's what the scripture says. And our steps are ordered just as much today in these troubling times as they were before they ever hit. God can use you today to make a difference for his kingdom and in the life of someone who's searching and seeking him. We shouldn't be selfish with the message of the gospel. Why? Because he wasn't selfish with it for us. It was on display on the cross for people to see. Just as the, the empty tomb is on display today for people to see, it's empty because our Savior lives. 
And we can't be standing around gloom, despair, agony. Oh, worry is me, worry is me. What are we going to do? We, we can't be fretting so much because we don't proclaim a message of fear. We proclaim a message of hope. And that hope, my friend, is in Jesus. That hope is in the blood of Jesus. That hope is in the majestic and holy, righteous name of Jesus Christ. For he alone saves. I really, really want to go back to that. A scared world needs a fearless church. We need to point people in the direction of the cross. We need to live our lives in a way that, that points people to Jesus. Turn with me to Colossians chapter 1, verses 24 through 28. And I want to show you in these scriptures where our hope is and where the hope of the world is found. It says this in Colossians 1, 24. I now rejoice, Paul speaking to the Colossians, I now rejoice in my sufferings for you. Notice Paul is rejoicing in his sufferings. Folks, people are suffering today. There are Christians who are suffering today. And, and, and hear me, I'm not being, uh, I'm not belittling what they're going through because I know how tough it is. I had a fever for a, a, of 102 and a half for three straight days. I, I get it. I understand it. And, and I'm still waiting on some test results to come back before we can even go out of our house. And I'm believing God they're going to come back negative. But nonetheless, I, I want you to know our hope is found in Jesus Christ. Our hope, as the song says, is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. All other ground is sinking sand. And if we of all people become hopeless, the world has no hope. But I'm here to tell you, we can rejoice in the suffering that we go through and we can rejoice because our God is a living God. Paul says in verse 24 of Colossians 1, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ. Oh, can I tell you, to identify with Christ and what he's going through fulfills our lives. For the sake of his body, which is the church, of which, Paul says, I became a minister according to the stewardship from God which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, the mystery which was hidden from the ages and from generations, but has now been revealed to his saints. Folks, if you're a saint of God, I want you to know something. The mystery of the Old Testament has been revealed to you. The Old Testament is can be can, can be listed like this or said like this. It is Jesus revealed, concealed. The New Testament is Jesus revealed. And, and as a believer in Jesus Christ, the mystery of the Old Testament has been revealed. And this is what it says from, from ages and generations of old has now been revealed to his saints. To them, uh, God will to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Hear that. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. There is no hope outside of Jesus Christ, period. There is no hope outside of Jesus Christ. And we above all people should be living a life of hope. We should be walking around with our countenance high, our countenance glowing, regardless of whether we're downtrodden, we're sick or afflicted, knowing full well that our God reigns, that what God has done for us is more than anything anybody could afflict us with. Folks, there is nothing, life or death, that can separate us from the love of God. Nothing at all. And it says here in the scripture, Christ in you, the hope of glory. You have the hope that the world longs for. You have the hope that the world needs. And hear me, I'm not telling you to go out and be reckless and, and, and not protect yourself. There are ways we can go about sharing hope and still be safe and not spread anything to anyone. Prayer goes a long way. And as I've said before numerous times, there are things that live on about us when we die. Our name and our prayers. It's time to start praying big prayers. Pray big prayers over your loved ones. Pray big prayers over your, your work, your employer. Pray big prayers over this country. And believe God is going to move in a big way. Because it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. 
Notice that scripture says in verse 28 right after that, it's him that we preach. I know Paul is speaking of himself, but it says the mystery has been revealed to the saints and it's him we preach, warning every man, teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Excuse me. <coughs> it's him we preach. Jesus Christ is the one that we preach. The hope of glory is not an event. It's a person. The hope of glory is not some cataclysmic, cosmic episode that's going to happen all at one time. The hope of glory is a person named Jesus. And that person named Jesus lives and dwells in you. And I want you to know that today. Be empowered today that the hope of glory, the hope of Jesus Christ, the hope of the whole world lives and dwells in you. Hear that believer. Believe it. Just let it jump all over you and believe it today. That the hope of glory lives and dwells in you. That same passage in, in Colossians says that Jesus Christ is the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form. And it says right after that, that we are complete in Him. We are complete in Him. It says in Colossians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, For in Him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you, you believer, you are complete in Him who is the head of all principality and power. The hope of glory rests in you. When the world says there's no hope, you don't listen to it. Why? Because the scripture says the hope of glory is in you. It's Christ in you, the anointed one in you, the Messiah, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the El Shaddai, the all-sufficient, all-providing, ever-present, all-knowing, all-powerful God lives and dwells in you. Believe that today, not because I say it, but because the Word says it. Because the Word says it. There's no more powerful prayer than you and I can pray than prayer straight from the Word. God, I thank you, Lord, that the hope of glory, the hope of Jesus Christ, Christ in us, is the hope that the world longs to see. And I'm praying right now, believing that you're getting it, that you're feeling the power of the Holy Ghost infiltrating your life, your home, your loved one, your body, and that something tangible is happening to you. The power of God through His Spirit lives and dwells in you and me. It's time we believe it. It's time we live it, and it's time we demonstrate it. There's no greater moment in the history of this country that we demonstrate the love of Jesus. It's not time to hate. It's time to love. It's not time to cast away. It's time to take in. It's not time to pray against. It's time to pray for. Pray for God to move. Pray for Him to touch and save. Pray for Him to heal. Pray for Him to deliver. Pray for him and pray it with an expectation, folks. Don't just pray one of these mamby pamby little sissy prayers. Lord, if it be your will, Lord, if it be. No, you pray boldly. The scripture says that we can enter into the very throne room of God boldly by the blood of Jesus and make our petitions known to him. You enter in boldly. It's not time to shrink back. It's time to press forward because as the, as the psalmist said, I will lift up, I'm lifting my eyes unto the hills from which cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord. I know where my help comes from. And I want you to know your help comes from him too. Just as Esther was born for an appointed time and place in history, you and I have been born for such a time as this to proclaim his story to the world. Hear that. We make history by proclaiming his story. And his story is this, Christ in you, the hope of glory. His story is he died for you. His story is this, he loves you right where you are. And he has a plan for your life. It's time for us to proclaim his story to the world with power and with love and with clarity. Romans chapter 8 
verses 9 through 17 say this. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. Hear that. The spirit of Christ has to dwell in us to belong to him. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. Your spirit as a believer in Jesus Christ has been made alive because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ, because of the sacrifice on the cross, because of his risen present state from the grave. His righteousness has made your spirit alive. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life, oh hear this, to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. If you're hungry and thirsty and you don't have strength today, I'm telling you, you rely on the spirit of Christ and you'll find your strength, your healing, your power, your peace, and, and, and you'll find your destiny. I'm telling you today, the spirit of Christ dwells in you. Is Christ in you the hope of glory. Listen to verse 12 of that same chapter in Romans. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. We can't look down. We can't look at Newsweek. We can't look at CNN. We can't look at Fox News. We can't look to those outlets to get our source of information. We can't look to those places. We can't look to the stock market to get our peace. We can't even look to our employer to get our peace. We have to look unto Jesus. We have to look unto him. Because while we are debtors, as the scripture says, not in the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if we live according to the flesh, we will die. But if by the spirit we put to death the deeds of the body, we will live. Verse 14 says, For as many as are led by the spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Hear me today. If you are a believer and you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you are a son of God. There is something to be said about the sonship of the believer. We are sons of God, not by what I say, but by what the scripture says. It says we are sons for as many as are led by the spirit of God. These are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again under fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by which we cry, Abba, Father, Daddy, Daddy. I want to tell you today, folks, it's Daddy, Daddy. You get real with God. You get real with God. You get honest with God and say, Daddy, I need your help. Daddy, I need your spirit. God, your word says, I'm one of your sons. I need your spirit. And you see, if we're a son, then we're an heir. That's what it says. If we're children, it says that the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. If you remember in Genesis, when God was creating the heavens and the earth, and he created man. He said, let us create man in our image. And in our likeness, let's create him. And, he, and God created man, formed him with his own hands from the dust of the earth. And he breathed into his nostrils his own spirit. God himself breathed into Adam and he became a living being. Today, as believers in Jesus Christ, when we are born again in the same manner, God breathes his life-giving spirit into our being and we become alive. We become sons and daughters of God. We become heirs of Christ because that's what the scripture says. In verse 16, the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if we indeed suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Now, I've said a lot to you today. I've given you instruction from Psalm 121, from Colossians chapters 1 and 2, from Romans chapter 8. And I want you to ponder those things this morning. I want you to ponder those things this afternoon. I want you to ponder those things in the days to come. Because I want you to know Jesus is alive and well. That Jesus is for you, not against you. And that if you are a saint of God, you're a son of God. And if you're a son of God, you're an heir of God. 
And if you're an heir of God, you're a joint heir with Jesus, which means we have access to everything that Jesus has access to. I, I feel some resistance on that one. But it's not my words that say it. It says, if any children in verse chapter verse 17 of Romans 8, if children then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Oh, we may be suffering right now. Morning may last for a night, but hear me, joy comes in the morning. Our sorrow, our tears may endure for a moment, for a night, for a season of darkness, but hear me, joy comes in the morning. And morning time is not just 6.30 a.m., every single day or 7.30 in the morning whenever the sun breaches the eastern horizon. Morning is when we awaken to who we are in Christ and we get a revelation of who we are in Him and we understand that we really are sons of God, that we really are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ and have access to everything that is in Christ Jesus and we implement that in the earth today as believers demonstrating it in power, love, and clarity to a lost and dying world that's hungry and thirsty for what you and I have, we have to do it, folks. We have to do it. It's not a choice. It's something that you and I are called to do, to be saints of God, living out this, uh, this life of a believer in front of the whole world in times of chaos. I want to close things down now a little bit, bring it back to an Old Testament scripture about togetherness. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 9 through 12, speaks of being together. What it means to be together and the strength that can come from being together and apart. Folks, we are stronger together than we are individually at any given moment. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9 says this, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. Obviously, two people can produce more than one person, meaning two people can reach more than one person. But I want you to think exponentially, mathematically, that as we expound and as we multiply, two times two times two times two times two, exponentially, two times two is four. Four to the second power is 16, and so forth. And you keep growing exponentially because two are better than one. And then verse 10 says this, For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. See, I'm not a believer that says I'm a church all by myself. Because if I'm a church all by myself, when I'm at my low moments, I don't have anybody to lift me up. You see, we as a body of believers in this moment of crisis, we can lift one another up through the power of prayer, through the profession of our faith, through the confession of the word over the lives of our loved ones and over ourselves. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And as we speak the word of God, we are producing faith in the word of God, God even to ourselves. Hear me. Woe to him who is alone when he falls for he has no one to lift him up. Again, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? Though one, here's the key verse, though one may be overpowered by or gathered together in his name, a threefold cord is not easily broken. And see, the cord that binds you and I together is the cord, the blood-stained cord of the cross, the blood-stained Jesus that died on the cross is the cord that holds us together. The scripture tells us
to set the captive free and to see the salvation of the Lord in the lives of those we love and we encounter. I encourage you today to lift up your eyes to the hills. I encourage you today to take your eyes off the news. I encourage you today, cut the TV off. Put some praise music on and bask in the presence of God and receive power and clarity and sound thinking and receive the love of Christ today like never before. I encourage you today to place your strength in him and not in yourself. That the all-providing, ever-knowing, ever-present, almighty God will prevail in these circumstances because we serve a mighty God. Let's pray together. Father, in the holy, in the mighty, in the matchless name of Jesus Christ, we come and we pray and agree together that, Lord, you are moving in mighty ways in our midst, God. That, Father, your spirit has freedom to move in our lives today. God, I pray that, Father, today we take a moment and we saturate our homes with praise and adoration unto you. And that healing power is released across this great land that lives are saved, that lives are healed, that families are reunited, God, today, God. And that, Father, even in this, what may seem like an awkward moment, Lord, there's power, there's unity, and, God, there's clarity of thinking. Lord, you've not given us a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. And, God, I declare that and decree that over Friendship Baptist, over Bartow County, over Georgia, over the United States, and even over the entire world, that the Christians, the saints of God, would realize it's Christ in us, the hope of glory, and that the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives and dwells in us, and that we are sons of God, that we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus, and that we have access to every single thing that Jesus has access to. Now, Lord, I declare it and decree it not in accordance with my word, but with the accordance and agreement with your word, that a threefold cord is not easily broken. And we come together as a body of believers, united under the banner of the Lord Jesus Christ, bound together by his blood, and stand firm on the foundation, the rock of the Lord Jesus, that on the revelation that he is the Christ, the son of the living God, that the church is founded, grounded, and built, and the gates of hell cannot, will not, shall not, and never can prevail against it. For it's in Jesus' mighty and holy name, I pray and agree, amen and amen. Thank you for joining us this morning for our time of, uh, of worship and praise and, and expounding of God's word. If you have a prayer request, feel free to leave it on our Facebook page and we will pray with you and pray over you. And God bless and I look forward to seeing you on Wednesday evening at 6 p.m. Uh, as we study the book of Matthew. God bless. Have a great day. I love you. So does Jesus.